Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome once again to another show of Inspirate. The show that is being created to help you, to inspire you, to empower you, to provide you hope in a world where we know is pretty challenged. We as Muslims specifically are faced with major challenges globally and locally in South Africa specifically with the opening of our doors with the democracy that we are so fortunate to have provides with its own challenges we are no more a homogeneous society that we were there's a lot more diversity that we are challenged with that is unshackling our very existence. It's unshackling many, many years of our community's values, systems that have been built in inherently. And this is creating angst. This is creating uh, introspection. There's uh, murmurings of negativity of us as Muslims and our role that we need to be playing in our communities, in our country, in our continent and globally. So on that score, we have an esteemed panelists that have uh, been specifically brought together, each with a constituent that they play in positively impacting. So, Ibrahim, if you can share a little bit in terms of how, as Muslims, we can deal with the challenges that we're facing. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I think uh, <clears throat> a good point would be an article I had written as the editorial for the Arushid many years ago, uh, just after 1994. And the topic of that was uh, isolation, assimilation, or integration. Uh, the choices that we as Muslims in South Africa face. And uh, I don't think change ought to frighten anyone, whether it's uh, political or social change. Um, Muslims have within their DNA the ability uh, to transcend the negative tendencies around them. Um, but as a society, if we took the stance of becoming isolationist, it would be detrimental to us as a, as a community and a society, and we've seen it in other parts of the world. Uh, if we took the attitude of total assimilation, as I've seen in Chile, for example, uh, Chile has the largest uh, ex-Muslim population from the area of Sham, um, and uh, the community was totally assimilated in uh, Chilean society as a result of which they virtually lost their deen. Uh, and the other would be integration. And successful Muslim communities throughout history are those that have integrated into the broader society and broader community. And uh, in order to do that, one obviously has to have an openness, a willingness, and a level of tolerance uh, to be able to live in a society that is comprised of many other different subcultures, colors, and uh, belief systems. I think that, that would be the crux of the issue. Mohammed? Yeah, no, I, <coughs> Ibrahim raises a very important point. In addition to those two, I think there are two other challenges that we need to address. Uh, the one, just to try and add on to what Ibrahim is saying, is how do we forge a Muslim identity within a broader South African identity? <coughs> and uh, I thought I saw Paul Pogba um, making sejda after the World Cup, mm -hmm. very proudly French. But I'm told two of them are in Medina right now, mm -hmm. and one of the players has even actually given his earnings to Bala Mosque in his original hometown. Mm -hmm. So striking that balance between your Muslim identity and your South African identity is very important. I think Ibrahim raises a very important point. I think there are two other issues that, amongst many other challenges, is we live in a dynamic world at the moment. <clears throat> Soon we'll be going into artificial intelligence. We have a burgeoning academic class in the next generation. Mm. 
And the question we've got to ask ourselves is whether our institutions as they stand at the moment have a resonance with its constituency. Mm. So we have racial diversity as we have seen. How do we convert that to a strength rather than dividing us? And the third is something that we would like to believe we're unique. We're not unique. Minorities have real or perceptions and fears. How do we address those fears? And how do we remove vulnerabilities that minorities have all around the world? Mm. Part, of, part of it may have been addressed by Ibrahim about integration. That may be one of the solutions. And I think these are areas that require a cohesive strategy mm. to try and address those. Mm. You guys make very good points, right, around integration, <coughs> but also about the fears. And this is where, Zia, you can come in. You know, mm. as somebody that's <coughs> young, relatively, <laughs> uh, compared to the rest of the group here, but also um, somebody that works so pas uh, passionately amongst youth, as youth, we obviously facing a lot of challenges being youth, but adding in the Islamic element to it does, does raise even more. And I think it goes back to what you guys were talking about on integration. So we haven't had that integration or assimilation, um, but as, as we are growing as a democracy and a country, we're finding Muslims being in places that are unfamiliar to where our, fo our fathers and their fathers were. So schools, workplaces, universities, etc. is completely different and we've thrown into different environments where people don't necessarily understand our backgrounds and you don't want to be in that situation where you risk losing your identity but you also don't want to be at the point where you don't become relevant or have a reason to be in the same struggles together because there are a lot of challenges that we collectively face beyond just being a Muslim or just being a South African. So trying to understand how we fit in in those places while still maintaining that Islamic heritage and ethos is definitely something that's really big and you've also thrown into areas where Historically, we weren't really needed to, to face things like how do you deal with Muslim women or females in, in the workplace in a professional way. We haven't really understood the ways of behaving, or the ways of making things productive while still maintaining the respect and the understanding of, of, the, of the other gender, um, different races as well. I mean, we have been insular and isolated from that perspective. And then you've also got leadership that hasn't experienced what you are, so they can't necessarily give you those cues or, or those ways of, of dealing with those things. So yeah, definitely a lot of challenges. So which, which actually comes, uh, there's a common theme, a DNA that I'm picking up, mm -hmm. right? It's whether it's the youth or uh, you know, institutions, uh, people in business, uh, just the common, and you sp <coughs> spoke of minorities, maybe this issue is not unique to Muslims, maybe it is, I mean, there is also this, on top of a minority issue, there's also, in this country, there's also a general Islamophobia issue, mm. which is a broader issue, right? So with all of those dynamics, right, the question then is, how do we deal with these challenges, right? With also bearing in mind that we also have to introspect. There are inherent strengths, they are inherent, and if you take historically, I mean the Muslim community in South Africa dates back 300 years, yes, right? And, and has played such a strong role socio-economically, politically in this country. With saying all of that, they are also major challenges, weaknesses that we also need to look at. This, you bring up about a few issues, the how are we dealing with diversity? Mm. Are we dealing with it? Are we, are we operating in this lager mentality? There is that criticism that also comes out. Um, the male and female issue, matriarchal, patriarchal, what, how are we dealing with that? You, and we've seen that uh, now, uh, been openly challenged. Just in Ramadan, we had a, a huge issue at one of the mosques. How are we dealing with that? One of the dangers when institutions don't enjoy the credibility of their, their constituents, you will find that the institutions will become irrelevant. Mm. 
And I got a recent statistic from the United States that while the Muslim population is increasing through immigration, the second and third generation Muslims, mm. 25 to 30 percent are leaving the faith. Mm. That is a reality. And if that is a reference point, mm. and when these kids are interviewed, what you find is that there is a vacuum. Mm. And the institutions have not been dynamic and have, haven't adapted and given mm. guidance. So there's an economic landscape that's changing. We need to understand economics and practice religion within that, the issue of interest, the issue of zakat. We have information technology where the youth now have access to information which was largely the monopoly of our religious institutions before. That in itself creates huge, diverse views how do we enable our youth to practice the Islam, apply their own intellectual, individual thought, but within the framework of a Muslim identity and a Muslim regulatory environment? But that regulatory environment has to be dynamic and it has to reflect the changing world. If we remain stagnant, the, the, the importance of symbolism if we are not going to have youth, all women in our institutions, how do we expect them to enjoy credibility and enjoy the confidence of the very people they want to lead? And those are some of the things. Ibrahim, sorry, I just need to say one thing here. We have inherent strengths as this Muslim community. Our charitable institutions, we are in captains of industry. We are in, here's a very good example, we are in, 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 in major corporations. We have sportsmen. It is about just rejigging mm -hmm. and using that strategically. Mm -hmm. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. And this is not new. Mm -hmm. Sheikh Yusuf, when he landed in South Africa 300 oh, Mawad, years ago. I'm just going to stop you there, right? Mm -hmm. We are uh, really looking forward to that story and also then getting Mohammed's input. Uh, 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 Ibrahim, I'm sorry, Maf, yeah. We have to take a break. We have robust discussion taking mm -hmm. place here. And we get in really into the depths of the discussion into what exactly are those challenges and how we can deal with it. We're talking Muslims and the challenges Muslims are facing in South Africa and globally. After the break, we'll go into in-depth discussions around the topic. Time is now. Time is now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're back on a very, very important topic. A topic of relevance. Uh, we're talking the challenges Muslims are facing in South Africa, Africa and the globe. And we were just getting into the meat and the crux of the discussion. Mohammed, you were talking and you were bringing in uh, Sheikh Yusuf. Are we talking of the history of uh, okay. So the Islam. first Muslims that came into South Africa came as slaves. Mm. Sheikh Yusuf and many of the other sheikhs whose, whose graves are in Cape Town at the moment, many of these slave, Muslim slaves, the, the, the imams that are there in Durban at the moment, mm. we, they had to fight slavery, they had to provide moral guidance, and they had to ensure that their flock remains within the fold of Islam. And they managed. Mm. So this is not reinventing the wheel. It required strength. They did not give up what they believed in. Mm. We can, there are many examples to follow. Just even in the modern, on softer issues, we've got Muhammad Salah, mm. we've got uh, uh, Hashim Amla. Mm. If I heard what Liverpool's coach had to say about mm. Muhammad Salah, yes. he says if ever there is a person who has changed the views about Muslims in England, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is Muhammad Salah by just being a Muslim. There's nothing special. Mm -hmm. But it is how we stick fast to our values, which are universal values. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, he was able to adjust in an environment that was non-Muslim. Mm -hmm. So it was about flexibility, not rigidity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, uh, Ibrahim, over to you. 100%. I think the, 
Um, Muslim community, if you again focusing on South Africa, and uh, sorry to all the Man United supporters <laughs> by that comment. But, uh, the Maybe we should make it more localized. <laughs> uh, right, yeah, yeah we're talking uh, demographics uh, and diversity. Demographics Please and bring diversity. Kaiser Chiefs and Orlando Pirates yeah. and of course Sunnows in the top. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. uh, the South African Muslim community, I think, punches above its weight, as has been mentioned already. Mm. And to a certain extent, we are victims of our own success. Mm. Now, if you're facing a problem of uh, living in diversity, no Muslim will ever be faced or will be overawed by uh, a diverse uh, culture or population around him. Any visit to the Haramain uh, for Hajj and Umrah will prove that. So a Muslim is adaptable by his very nature or by her very nature. And um, so adaptability is the key to changing circumstances. Mm -hmm. So we have that built in within our, our, our fiqh, we have that built in in our training as Muslimin. Secondly, um, those Muslim communities and societies that failed to adapt to change mm -hmm. were the ones that lost out. Now, this is the kind of challenge that we are facing. The, 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 the critical challenge of change change in your political environment, change in your uh, diversity, in, in your workplace, for example, in your studying uh, in, the, in, the, in the various avenues of uh, knowledge, um, and then also perception and Islamophobia. Now, the very point that Muhammad has raised is Muhammad Salah did not do anything extraordinary. He just committed to himself to be a Muslim. Hashim Amla did the same. He didn't have to do anything extra. So if one sticks to one's faith uh, in a, and, and one obviously, um, you, you attach yourself to your faith out of reason and rationalism, uh, if it is done purely on an emotional basis, it will fluctuate, mm. it will not be steadfast. So if you stick to your faith in a manner that does not uh, uh, you know, impact upon the uh, negative ways of people around you, you will make an impression in whatever uh, condition or society you are. So if you are a CEO of an organization which is totally, uh, the boardroom is surrounded by people of other faith, and you are taking time off to perform your salah or you are ensuring that there's tahara in the washrooms, that's a mark that you are leaving where you are. Mm -hmm. If you are speaking out against the riba institutions and the cancer of compound interest in the boardroom, you will find resonating voices around the boardroom table and not always from people who are of the same, of your faith. Mm -hmm. Because what you are saying mm -hmm. is a universal truth, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So Muslims do not have to do anything special. Mm -hmm. They have to be who they are, mm -hmm. but they have to increase themselves in knowledge. Mm -hmm. They have to increase themselves in the understanding of what a Muslim should be mm -hmm. in any environment. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reminded of the article that I had written on Muslim executives wanted, and this took place barely 35 mm -hmm. years ago, mm -hmm. when we were still at UDW. There was an article that appeared in the uh, uh, Daily News of, in Durban, and in the classified section, uh, there was um, a screaming headline, Muslim executives wanted. Mm -hmm. And this was in 1981. Mm. It was a time of the oil embargo. It was the time of the arms embargo. Mm. Mm. And the immediate mm. connotation of that uh, article or that advert was that this had to do something with uh, secretive deals in the oil industry or secretive deals in the arms industry. Mm. 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 And my two flatmates dared me to go and attend the interview. And out of a dare, I went for the interview. And it had nothing to do with either oils or arms. To cut a long story short, I ended up getting the job out of maybe 25, 35 other hopeful Muslim mm. executives who were there. But it had to do with partnering with a preeminent South African industrial family, mm. white, mm. in the cosmetic industry. Mm. And the Italian uh, person that did the final interview, I, I was a little upset with mm. him. I said, uh, I, I don't want to be involved in cosmetics. Mm. Uh, why did you label the advert Muslim executives wanted? But his answer made my day. He said in, in his broken Italian English, look, Mr. Patel, I am in your country for maybe uh, four mm -hmm. months. Mm -hmm. I know a banker, I know a lawyer, I have a shipping agent, 
and I have a chemist. Mm. And I ask these four people, I am looking for someone who is passionate about his work, who has absolute honesty, mm. who has absolute integrity, and they all told me these are the qualities of Muslims. Mm. Mm. Right? So yes. his answer made my yes. day. And that's the example. Now, 35 mm. years later, mm. would that still hold true? That's the challenge we face. Mm. Right? Perceptions that we have created from our own actions. Mm. And we need, to, we need to change that. Perhaps later on we could decide. Yes, how we I mean, do what that. you're talking about is examples. I mean, Muhammad mentioned uh, Muhammad Salah, you mentioned Hashim Amla. You're using this of what, how did people gravitate toward Muslims and how are people gravitating to Muslims is through example. Yes. Absolutely. It's through your character, conduct. your akhlaq. Conduct. Right? Your conduct. Yeah. Now, is that what, from a youth perspective, and I'm going to really yeah, hone, right. I mean, the, 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 right, we, we, that's the reason why you're sitting <laughs> here in that hot seat as well, right, is, is, is that how, the, because what I'm also finding, and, and maybe you can maybe just uh, sort of act as a measurement of that, yeah. is that are the youth really comfortable in that what you talk about, that identity? Are they comfortable to say, this is my Muslim identity and yet being able to integrate in society? Because, or is it this dichotomy? Because I'm finding that, and it may be wrong, and, and please challenge yeah. me, is, that, is there not a dichotomy? That there's a Muslim identity and then there's this Western world and I'm confused between the two. Yeah. Right? Uh, I think you're 100% right. So I've obviously been in organizations that are not Muslim. So I've mm. worked in in traditional hmm. corporate South Africa, which is sometimes very new or don't, don't really know about Muslims. So even hmm. though we have punched above our weight and, and done quite a, bit things, quite a few things as a Muslim community, there are many people in South Africa that have never really engaged with a Muslim. Like hmm. you'd find it during Ramadan time where it would still be a very confusing con discussion. It's like you can't drink water. Hmm. Like they hmm. still don't know what being a Muslim means and what hmm. those requirements are as a Muslim. And that comes with the, fun, the funny parts, but it's mm. also the difficult parts when mm. it comes to leaving for mosque on a mm. Friday or making your prayer time or leaving the meetings for a prayer time. And, and it makes it hard. And I think some of that needs to be addressed by not the individual, because sure, the individual can be a standout Muslim mm. like Muhammad Salah or Paul Pogba, but when you are entering this environment that's established and quite big, you will struggle to, to easily convey those requirements as a, as, a, as a smaller person, as an individual. And I think that's one of the difficulties that we face. Yes. Yeah. So may I just come in here. You see, my generation certainly owes it to the next generation. Mm. And if there isn't a consistency and in, in a harmony, particularly in the religious leadership, mm. at a time when the change, the changes, you, it's so difficult to change mm. and adapt to a changing world, we make it so much more difficult when there is inconsistency mm. and when there is such a conflict of ideas mm. and where there is such an intolerance mm. of different ideas. What do we leave for young Muslims to look up to? Mm. It's, it, it makes it particularly difficult for them. And I, I, I just would want to add this and say that it appears that we are emphasizing our differences more mm -hmm. than the things that unite mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And if we look back at the golden age of Islam, yeah. and that was the time in Baghdad, mm -hmm. where other denominations came to study and to become leaders in their fields and they learned from the Muslims, what was the one underlying feature that they had there? Mm. There was an environment in a room for intellectual and individual thinking. Mm. There may have been a diversity of ideas, there may have been an exchange of ideas, but that diversity added to a richness, mm. not personal attacks, mm. that confuses another generation. And that generation is not going to forgive us. Okay, thank you. That was an uh, awesome session. Uh, we brought up some wonderful discussions. We're talking of akhlaq. We talked of character, right, about being an example. And importantly, about allowing for individuality, yet with this unifying philosophy. Let's get into more detail around it in the next segment. After the break, 
will go into some of the deeper challenges that we're facing as Muslims. Time is now. Time is now. This is Inspirate and we talk in the challenges Muslims face in South Africa. And on that note, let's get down. Right? And I I know that as a community, as a society, as Muslims, we tend to, and we focused a lot about the good. You talked of Muhammad Salah, you talked of Hashim Amla, uh, captains of industry, and why you know you were chosen because of your khlaq. But let's be honest. Let's be honest. Not everything that we're doing is positive. Uh, as much as uh, there's some great examples, you just need to flip through the newspaper on a Sunday and you see some of the most prominent, uh, not so kosher, not so halal uh, gentlemen and ladies happen to have Muslim names, right? Is that a generalization? Is that an indictment? You know, you guys share some insight. Yeah, you see, I think the, the moral high ground to a certain est extent has been lost by our community. Uh, if you look at the names that you are mentioning in the press, people of dubious character, people mm. who have given the community a bad name because of their uh, evil actions in the business world or wherever, uh, this, is, this has impacted negatively upon us. It has changed the perception of the community as a whole. I just want to go back to a point that Mohammed raised earlier about uh, our, ch our charitable institutions. Now, if you're asking me for a, for a quick 10-point um, plan in which uh, we need to actively, and as, an, as an act of emergency, actually implement these pointers. Firstly, we need to uh, think global, mm -hmm. but act local. Mm -hmm. We have a Somalia within half an hour's drive of every masjid in South Africa. Yes. Right? We have, a, uh, we have refugees. Uh, so it's fine to give money to Syrian refugees, alhamdulillah. Mm. But I think our charity needs to be focused 99% on local turf. Mm. Because we have a Syrian refugee, refugee camp, uh, perhaps not filled with Syrians, but other nationalities, half an hour's drive from this masjid. We have a kindergarten, half an hour's drive from this masjid, that doesn't have uh, writing material. Mm. And the kids don't have food to eat in their break. So our charity needs to be focused 99% within our borders. So firstly, we, there needs to be an introspection. You spoke about introspection. We need to have an inward looking um, focus right now. So generate your charity um, locally. There are educational institutions, there are uh, uh, orphanages, there are refugee camps that need our assistance, right? Uh, there are areas that need wells to be dug for water, uh, right here. We're not talking about Sudan, we're not talking about Somalia, right here. So focus locally. If every institution, if every masjid, if every Muslim school adopts a school in their area mm. that does not have the required standards of education, mm. right, it will, be, it will go a long way in uh, sowing the seeds mm. of, of, of baraka mm -hmm. for the community. Right? Imagine what will happen if every uh, Muslim school in, 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 in South Africa has adopted a school in their area and has made a tangible difference in the quality of the life and quality of the education of that adopted school. Mm. Right? It will immediately uh, have a spin-on effect, what, what Warren Buffett calls a snowball effect. Yes, yes. Um, going to point number three. Uh, Muslim organizations should immediately put a stop and an end to name calling an, an organization or an institution or an individual that differs from them in the application of their faith. Immediate stop to all of that. Uh, this ikhtilaf, this type of uh, differences of opinion is not healthy for the youth, it's not healthy for the community, and it's not healthy for our perception as a community. Mm. We, will we will perceive to be a united community for many years. And this uh, has developed cracks. Now cracks will appear 
in any society which is in flux. Mm. That's a standard uh, socio-economic uh, doctrine. It will happen anywhere, in any society, in any part of the world. Mm. How you manage the cracks, how you manage the differences mm. is the key issue. And I yes. think we need to focus on, on that. On that differences, right, you brought up some very good points. Uh, I, I'd like to also take it to maybe on a social level, right? I, I experienced a lot of uh, scholars that have come to South Africa, international scholars. And they are picking up something very strongly, saying historically, if you take the Muslim community, it is an indo pak uh, uh, origin, origin yeah. as well as a Malay Indonesian origin, right? Uh, obviously, there's now an opening, so there's a first uh, generation coming through in terms of, you know, from various parts of the world. Yet, the reality is this is a minority that's living in a majority African black country, right? The question that is being posed is. How much are we doing? You brought up something powerful in terms of charity. But let's take it on a practical social level, right? We, this, uh, there are imams speaking on the pulpit now about, let's introspect from even a race issue. Right? And let's not brush these things under the carpet because when we introspect, introspect and we are aware, then change can take place, transformation can take place. Muhammad, what are we doing in terms of uh, you know, being able to interact in a harmonious way, in a humanity way, with those of different races, creeds? How would you react to that? Well, I, you see, there's a fundamental question. In fact, mm -hmm. I was having a discussion with a friend of mine this morning. If you read Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's oh, last Allah. sermon, mm -hmm. You read the Magna Carta, you read the Freedom Charter, and you read the Bill of Rights. Mm. The universal principles mm. that exist in Rasulullah did it 1400 years ago. Mm. For me to be a good Muslim, I need to be a humanitarian. Mm. Mm -hmm. And that's the basis upon which I start. Mm -hmm. So even my charity mm. is based on humanity, nothing else. Mm. Rasulullah was respected around the world for his conduct, not only to Muslims, mm. but to non-Muslims as well. Mm. So, if we are selective in our morality, and Ibrahim talks about some of the infamous names that have been coming in the newspapers that have brought the Muslim community to shame, that's it. Mm. Mm. But equally, there must be equal condemnation from our communities to show people if we don't do that, we are seen as an insular community that protects even its own bad people. Mm -hmm. yes, yes. So let's start with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We must equally condemn the killing of a Muslim, of a non-Muslim, yes. by a Muslim of a non-Muslim, and we must condemn it the same way. We can't yeah. be selective in our morality. No. Our religion is based on a universal humanity, and that's what Rasulullah was all about. Mm -hmm. The last sermon, we can have disputes and arguments and, and interpretations, but the last sermon remains. Mm. And in that last sermon, the thrust of that mm -hmm. was looking after the vulnerable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He spoke about widows, mm -hmm. orphans, and he spoke about his values that he wanted mm -hmm. to resonate amongst his ummah for the rest of, mm -hmm. until Qiyamat. Mm -hmm. The question is, do we do justice to that? And mm -hmm. if we do justice to that, then we'll be a benefit to this country as a whole. Mm. And race, color, he said an Arab is not superior to a non-Arab. Mm. That is the Magna Carta that was written mm. 1400. 1400. We have yeah. special <coughs> gems with us. Mm. Just being a Muslim, mm. you are Muslim because you are humanitarian and you are a humanitarian because you are Muslim. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Either on, way, on and that, we yeah. just mm. propose, you know, expose that. Mm. Then what has, but the important point is, if our institutions are not going to reflect that dynamic that's taking place in our community, where it is not dominated by one racial group anymore, mm -hmm. then we need to ask ourselves a question. 
Do I want to be relevant? Do I want to be credible? Mm. And are people going to listen? This applies to women. This applies to the educated emerging youth. Mm. That is the strategy we have to, that's the low hanging fruit we have mm. to go for. Yeah, On that hair raising uh, moment, because that truly has impacted me. I mean, the truth of the matter is that what is Islam about? Islam is about humanity first. I think that's your point. Mm. And that's the, what's coming out very, very strongly. And if we are not able to adopt these principles, because a lot of people say one thing, that if we were to judge Islam its on followers. the character of its followers, mm. then we wouldn't come to this religion, as beautiful as it is. On that note, we take a quick break, and then we come into the last segment, and we get down into what can we do? What can we do practically mm -hmm. to be able to turn this struggle into opportunity, yeah. into hope for our people? Mm -hmm. We'll see you after the break. Time is now. Time is now. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We back again as Inspirate. Uh, talking uh, the challenges Muslims are facing in South Africa, Africa and the globe. And we've had some robust discussions, we've had uh, some wonderful insight shared by our esteemed panelists. Let's get down to some practical inputs, right? We, uh, I mean, think somebody sitting out there as a Muslim, there's all these challenges. I'm a lady and I have this challenge from this male-female domination issue, male dominating female. Uh, there's, we talked on some of the race issues, we talked of some of the institutions, we talked of charity. Where does that go to? Mm. Right? How can I uh, be impacted positively? If you can give me something practical mm. as a Muslim in South Africa to make me relevant in my little community, in my workplace, how do I become relevant? Uh, yeah. So I think it goes back to what Mohammed was mentioning earlier about humanity, that Islam is about humanity. And we have to recognize that the people around us are human and also need to be given the due respect and care for their beliefs along with your own. So you can't let go of your own beliefs, but you've got to respect that those other beliefs are in play. Mm. And if you maintain that respect while still being steadfast in your own, you would become a lot more accepted and relevant. Mm. And people understand, they know the rules of the game mm -hmm. once you have put that out there. And I know in my own experience, that served me well. Like you do have those, those non-negotiables mm -hmm. that you stick to and you're consistent with. And that helps you become an easier person to, to understand from, a, from an outsider mm. and to be respected. That definitely helps a lot. And, and we do look to our leadership and for that leadership to, to be more practical as well. They need to speak about the things that matter to us the stuff, the challenges that we are facing. The, when a young person now leaves the university and wants to look for a job, the de facto can't be a financial services institution mm. or something that doesn't gel with your beliefs. We need to provide those kind of institutions and, and areas where you can still be a Muslim and still be true to your faith while being a contributing member to society. And that, I think, is what South Africa requires, more contributing members to society. And we need to ensure that as Muslims, we maintain that without losing our faith. I agree with that 100%. I think the, in terms of the youth, uh, Ziad has mentioned an important point that the graduate shouldn't end up in a financial institution. Now traditionally, uh, if you're looking at the South African Muslim youth, um, over the past 30 to 40 years, mm. the uh, vocations of choice have either been uh, medicine, law, pharmacy, uh, engineering, uh, accountancy, mm. Uh, and there's perhaps an overdominance of one vocation over the other. Mm. But now, and, I, and I always raise this issue in that uh, for many years, the largest masjid in Southern Hemisphere, in the Southern Hemisphere, was the Grace Street Masjid, right? Which mm. was uh, put up by the Mormon Pop trader, mm. the trading community. Mm. Uh, today, the largest masjid in the Southern Hemisphere is put up by a man who worked with his hands, right? He wore a overall in a hard hat and safety goggles and safety shoes, the one in Midrand. Mm. So 
there is value in working with your hands. Many of our um, prophets, alayhim mm, salam, uh, were people who worked with their hands, whether they were carpenters or ironmongers, right? And uh, in South Africa, we have a critical skills shortage. Mm. Mm. Now, as a Muslim community, we are blessed in the sense that we have entrepreneurial skills, mm. which we can impart to others around us, because mm. it's only entrepreneurship that creates jobs. Mm. No government minister with his blue light gang is going to legislate jobs into existence. Jobs have to be created in an enabling environment where entrepreneurship flourishes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, Japan is a prime example, South Korea, many others. Mm. So we can share that which we mm. are strong in, mm. in entrepreneurial skills. We can start skills development centers, right? Because uh, unfortunately, ask any business that's paying a fee to any of the CETAs, the CETAs are a total disaster in terms of, uh, I call it uh, parallel taxation by ambush. Um, so th since the CETAs are not doing what they're supposed to be doing, we can do it from a humanitarian angle. That can be part of our charitable contribution. Mm. It doesn't have to be uh, a blanket or a food parcel all the time. Charity uh, can, be also, can also be done on the basis of raising the level of consciousness and ilm mm. in a society, which our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did and our Kabirin did in many different uh, places throughout the world, mm. Mm. right? Mm. They were sent as teachers. Mm. And w one thing that our youth need to catch on fast to is, we seem to have lost the culture of reading. Mm. Mm. And mm. readers make leaders. Mm. Mm. The culture of reading in, in our community seems to be disappearing. Mm. The second thing is that if you take a, a, a rudimentary census on our, in our schools, it seems to be that the female students are advancing far higher than the male, mm. right? So in the youth setup, you'll have a female who has a bachelor's degree and perhaps an honors degree, mm. and the youngster went to varsity on a jol uh, because mom and dad gave him the mm -hmm. car and the flat to stay in, etc., etc., and he had an easy mm -hmm. life. And he bailed out of university, and he's, uh, uh, he's, got, a shop in, he's got a job in the uncle's shop. And he's earning 15 grand a month. And the lady that he gets married to, who's a bachelor with an honors, is maybe earning 50 grand a month. Mm. What do you think is going to happen after three years of marriage, mm. right? After the honeymoon is mm. over. So there needs to be a re-emphasis mm. amongst, in the youth as well, in terms of fields that are open to them now, mm. which, were, which were barred mm. to us in the past, mm. right? right? So in the steel making industry. I just want to, uh, Mohammed, Ma yeah. if you can just come in there, right? Uh, we've got a few minutes left. Sure. So I'd just like you to come in and, and, and maybe from your perspective and in terms of uh, what Ibrahim was saying, uh, practically, right, as a Muslim, how, how do I deal with the challenges? F firstly, I, I mean, I, I just want to let you on, but in mm. another way, in becoming an integral part of this, not that we are not an integral part, but to be, to be part of and integrate with the society, the government administrations, you speak about the CETA, are yeah. struggling. Mm. We have the skill set and we have the resources to develop a skill set. We as in Muslims. Muslim community. Yes, Muslim community, right? yes. But we must also not forget that the Gini coefficient within the Muslim community is so high. Mm. We can't focus on those that are only successful. Mm. Mm. I mean, I know of a struggling widow traveling from Mitchell's Plain who has to come to work every day, travel mm -hmm. an hour, two hours, or a lady coming in from Soweto or El Dorado Park. Mm -hmm. So the profile of the Muslim community is not one of immense wealth mm -hmm. and the entrepreneurial class, no. Mm -hmm. The larger part are working class people struggling to make ends meet. Mm -hmm. We have to address our own Gini coefficient. Forget about the whole country, mm -hmm. it exists here, and the Within fact that it exists is something that we need to be embarrassed about, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So immediately, to be part of this country and to bring our skill set, mm -hmm. the government administrations, forget the politicians. It's about being in government administrations where you can do good for the country, you can put food on your table, and you can develop your skills mm -hmm. and contribute to this country in a very meaningful way. I'm not saying we mustn't be in political life, mm -hmm. but this is where the need is in this country. Mm -hmm. That skill set, the CETA you're talking about. Mm -hmm. We are struggling because 
the state machinery is struggling. Mm. And that is low-hanging fruit. Mm. We need to popularize and conscientize people to go in there. Mm. Secondly, and that's the point that has been made here, 12th century, the largest Muslim community in the world is Indonesia. Mm. And they became Muslim because a few traders from India came. Yeah. And it is just through the honesty of their business. Mm. The way they did their business with honesty that today we have the largest Muslim population. But equally, if our business people make nonsense mm. and they shame us, we must name and shame them. Mm. We can't be seen to tolerate because what it does is it infects our reputation and, and, and what our forefathers have built here. Mm. Okay, on that note, thank you, uh, gentlemen. Uh, that was really powerful. We unfortunately don't have uh, more time. We probably have to do another show where we can go into the depths of it. This is such, uh, such a powerful uh, topic. Uh, I mean, something that we can spend many, many hours talking about. I think we've covered quite a bit uh, for the viewers out there. As you know, uh, it is a challenge. There's a lot of positives. I think we have to acknowledge as Muslims, we have played a major role in this country. We have played a major role in this country, and it's about continuing to play that role, but being relevant in our societies. Skills development, institutional change, and adaptation that is required. A youth that is asking, who can lead me? Who can take me? With being proud as Muslims, yet being an integrated into a broader society. And that is our challenge. Who can be the Muhammad Salahs out there? Who can be the Hashim Amlas out there? The Paul Pogbas out there? And so many other examples. That is the opportunity. Wherever there's challenge, there's always opportunity. And this is what we do as Inspirate, is to provide hope for those that are in darkness. We encourage you to provide input, constructive input, criticism if you wish. Let's engage in debate. We, at the bottom of the screen, you see our Inspirate handle, our website, please engage with us so that we can take our Ummah into a relevancy, into a progressiveness, into success as we go into the future. I thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.